Good afternoon. We're joining Greg Perry, historic preservationist, to discuss his training in France in obtaining an advanced conservation degree. Good afternoon, Greg. Good afternoon. And um, prior to getting into those details, could you explain a little bit the apparent um, disinterest in culture and fine art of people generally under 50 and their lack of appreciation for pieces of value um, that apparently drove the furniture industry and the art market down? Well, for, for many years, almost 50 years going into the late 90s, the, uh, the traditional art market, it could have been uh, glass, paper, fabric, uh, in particular wood or furniture, was strong, building to a crescendo through the 80s um, with antiquity and until the mid, probably late 90s, 97, 98. And then, uh, then we had a crash and, and uh, no one seems to know why. We, uh, many of us artists have hashed this, this topic around and the Rialto Bridge in Venice, the Bastille Monument in Paris and my trips there. And we've all tried to figure out what went wrong, what is the turning point. Um, the bottom line, the, the economy turned a bit, um, but I think it's a societal one. We have people that aren't interested in, uh, in uh, old or antiquity in general, like particularly when we talk about furniture, they term it old ground furniture. Um, today, everything, number one, seems to be extraordinarily disposable. The only uh, art market that's really strong is probably uh, contemporary art. You could say like uh, somebody that throws paint against a, a wall with an airplane propeller, just garbage like that. Um, and the traditional classic Greek inspired, Italian inspired, French inspired um, art architecture is not, is not chic anymore. And I think it's gen a generational shift um, like we've never seen before. This is a huge swing. Uh, at times we were going into a 10 year hiatus. This is going into about a 20, 25 year swing now, um, bringing the, the numbers of classic pieces of uh, sculpting and paintings down um, exponentially. And I often put out there when I'm doing my, my talk circuit that a, a clock that I purchased back in 2000 from a famous London maker, a tall case clock for over $12,000 less commission, um, seeing these clocks come up around 14 through uh, 2018, um, 800, 1,000, 1,200 dollars. So exponentially, just figuratively speaking, um, they've really just tumbled, absolutely tumbled. Uh, don't see this coming back anytime soon. But the interesting thing is, uh, through the 90s when I was building furniture, I was building it for individuals that are no longer here. Their kids have inherited their furniture inherited their antiquity collections. They come to me for updated appraisals. Um, how do I sell? They're using my service for selling as a broker. And uh, they think they're gonna get top dollar, which they were appraised at in the early, mid, late 80s, mid 90s. And uh, you know, a clock, clock collection that could have been appraised just hypothetically in, in 1985 for 1.1 million in a client uh, is now worth about 250,000. So. And uh, we have Junior coming here. He thinks he can go out and buy a, uh, a Ferrari with it. And uh, mom and dad have passed on and he can buy about uh, half a car. So unfortunately, but with, with disregard of, of the antiquity they were brought up around, but by and large people, you know, from zero to 40 come in. They don't, they can't tell when they come through my studio the difference between vinyl and, and leather. They have no conception. They don't know if it's real wood fabricated wood, wood landed on a computer, and it's very sad. So I, I just feel that we're dealing with a qualityless society and they don't care about these tangible things that make you feel comfortable and warm and, and bring, bring to heart where we've come from as a country, as a nation, as a world, um, as a society. And, and that's just not desired anymore. So it's quite shocking and it took me in, in, in my studio quite the time to get over it because it caused a crash back in the early 2000s. I had to lay off my furniture makers, which were three at that time. And, uh, and then I had to make a career path. So I, I chose to stay in an ancillary field. I, I went in conservation and restoration, getting degrees in clock and watchmaking and conservation of antiquity. Well, that is a shame. And are Europeans and Asians also experiencing the same cultural collapse as Americans? Um, they are to a lesser degree. When, when you go to Europe or some of the Asian countries I've been to, they, they still have a, uh, 
a uh, profound grasp on, on where they're from, who they are, their own culture, which, you know, to, by and large, going across the, the mid-Atlantic states, it's cultural this year in America today, the generations that are, you know, the up-and-coming generations. So, um, But when you're, in, when you're in France, you're in Italy, you're in Spain, you're in England, they, younger people understand, and they still want to surround themselves with antiquity. They can go down to the corner shop, the, quote, used furniture shop over there, and for just a few thousand dollars, be filled with just wonderful pieces of sculpting and, and gilding and marquetry and things like that. Um, and they appreciate it. Has it waned? Yes, I think it's waned a little bit. But yet what, what I've seen in the last 15 years is countries like China, um, Russia, um, buying back antiquity, and even France is seemingly setting uh, legal mandates possibly to buy back their cultural heritage. Um, you know, putting feelers out, say, in the States or in other countries in Canada saying, you know, they're going to pay top dollar for any French antiquity. So um, it's, it's moving back toward pulling back what belongs to them. And, and this led us to an earlier uh, a video we did, uh, you know, maybe a few weeks back stating that how in the mid 19th century, early 19th century, when all these major museums of the world, like the Metropolitan and even the V&A and some of these other museums around the world went over to uh, Pompeii and Herculean and they literally raped it. They raped it. They raped it of objects and historical stuff that wasn't theirs. And you know, go to the Met today and you can go to the V&A and the British Museum and you can see these things and it's, it's not right. So we're seeing probably a resurgence of buying back stuff, but yes, Europeans and the Asian countries are much more astute on their cultural heritage than we are. And back to that the furniture market, were there any indicators that the furniture market was declining? No, it was quite the quite the, the broadside. I mean, things were going very well. In fact, in my studio of making furniture, we were uh, probably, you know, three, two and a half, three years behind. And, uh, you know, going into 1999, into 2000, and boom, it just, it just stopped like a train. We were kind of getting off the end of this, this cell phone craze. Everybody had to have one or two or... So everybody's cell phoned up and technology upped and, uh, and the stock market was running. We went under one, an election and uh, there was an election and, and Bush was, was elected, like him or not, back in the early 80s. And uh, he had a vendetta against the, uh, his, he had a vendetta because of his father, you know, what, 10, 10 years earlier, the Prime Minister of Paris, or Prime Minister, sorry, of Canada. And a lot of the American lumber would come out of Canada. He raised the lumber tariff some 27.5% on Canada in the early 2000s, and it literally destroyed. So this was a, another factor we haven't yet spoken upon, but it destroyed the lumber industry um, in North Carolina because, as we mentioned in a previous video, High Point was the capital of furniture making. So with that stroke of the pen, no longer were these American-based companies buying a, the bulk of their lumber out of Canada because they couldn't afford it. And this was all done from a vendetta uh, going maybe 10, 12 years back uh, with the Prime Minister of Canada. So Bush would once wipe the pen. But that probably set some things in motion. It set a lot of these companies um, seeking China, Vietnam, and, and other Asian entities to, to build furniture for them. And it's funny because, you know, they'll, they, they have their, their outlets here and it says, oh, it's a cherry, it's walnut. It's, it's, it has nothing to do with cherry and walnut. They're, they're making it a brown color, a, a red color and they're calling it A or B. And it's, it's probably, again, the, the, the people, the buying public, the ignorant buying public, seeing this second class furniture that's sold from these factories is saying, oh, that's what cherry looks like or that's what walnut looks like, you know, and, and that's not the case. It's, again, buyer beware and, and uh, you know, the, the, the fake branding that goes on all the time on the, on the TV screen, so. Well, after the furniture market uh, did decline and you uh, determined that you had to close your furniture business, what advanced educational choices were at your disposal? Well, what, deciding to stay in the ancillary field, first let's look at um, wanting to get an advanced degree in conservation and restoration. Um, there's only <laughs> literally a few ways you can go. And there's literally nothing, nothing in America in this field. Um, if you want the real deal, you've got to go to Europe or you go to uh, England. So um, first we'll take a look at Europe uh, basically, you can go to the École Boulle. At the École Boulle, um, to get a, an advanced degree in conservation restoration, 
Um, it'll take you during the week, you know, you'll get into the Chateau de Versailles and the Louvre Museum. So you're, you're hitting major entities where antiquity rests um, and, and working on it there. And the great thing about the Eco Bull is that it's, you're loading up into an apprenticeship program that's underway. Going to, for my year and a half program there, I'm not in that apprentice, but I'm actually with students that are in that seven year apprentice program. So how crazy is this starting in seventh grade? So in some of these classes, you'd have seventh graders, you'd have 12th graders in, in upholstery, uh, in, in uh, finishes and, and blacksmithing and things like that. So, but these kids are serious and, and uh, a good percentage of them are females and they're very serious about what they do. And, uh, and there's a lot of, can be learned from that because there's a lot of camaraderie going on there and everybody's trying to help each other. So uh, it's, it's a very good thing. So that's dealing with the ACO Bull in Paris. Up and beyond that, um, the option is in England is West Dean College. So West Dean is located in Southampton, England, and it's the premier conservation school in the world. And, and what makes West Dean in particularly special is they have, um, they have four-year degrees, bachelors, they have master's degrees, they have PhD degrees in conservation. And uh, the sky's the limit. Uh, we, you can get a degree in leather conservation, you can get a degree in paper conservation, um, wood, and the only degree in the world in clocks and clock and watchmaking. So conservation clocks can only be had at West Dean. So very special there. Um, so there, there's your two choices essentially. And I, I think part and parcel, one of the uh, deciding factors is where do you, uh, where do you wanna be? If you're West Dean, you're in a, in a essentially it's a, in a castle sitting on maybe two, three, four hundred acres. I can't recall now, but it's this beautiful uh, bucolic setting of grass and sheep grazing around the castle. And essentially you're kind of uh, held up in the castle and you can walk down the, the main hallway and you can be in, in the, the, the Luther studio. So they're making violins there and they're restoring violins or other musical instruments. Um, you can go down to the leather conservation studio or the furniture conservation. So depending what you're there for. So there's always cross information when you're at break, you're at lunch, after the fact, and even on the weekends if you have some downtime. So, but it, it causes a sense of isolation because you need a car to get around. It's probably three, four miles from uh, the nearest town. Um, and you have to either take a bicycle to get in or buy a car or rent a car when you're there to move around. So it creates a little bit of a dilemma. Um, and you don't have quite the cultural aspect of going to the Eco Bull in Paris because that's sitting in, in you know, the central Paris around Nation. So, uh, and, you know, moving around Paris, you're always moving around on the metro or I had a bike or a, a moped at times. So, um, so it's, it's pretty cool to be in the greatest, most beautiful city in the world. Uh, but up and beyond that, um, the, the process at Eco Bull is strictly um, a conservation program in furniture and related wooden artifacts. And how easy or difficult was it to get accepted into these advanced programs? Uh, both programs are quite, quite rigorous, um, can take up to probably six months of, you know, getting the proper paperwork in and they check your references, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, six months advanced, but unfortunately, both of them don't tell you to the last minute. And it could be Friday afternoon and say, hey, we'll see you here on Monday. So there's not a chance to get your, your living situation quite straight. Um, the really cool thing about West Dean, though, you're actually living in the castle. So you have your, your room with your bathroom, and then they have a commissary that you have three meals a day. So that's kind of like a, like a boarding type school, which is very interesting, as opposed to the Eco Bull, which, you know, you could live anywhere in Paris and walk, uh, you know, walk to school there. That is interesting. And I know that you did go to France um, first, I believe. Uh, can you give us an idea of your accommodations? while you were there? Well, it was quite haphazard. The school actually provided some references and <laughs> I showed up the morning of the first class and, and someone from the school actually picked me up at the airport, uh, knowing a bit French just to save myself, but they picked me up, took me to class and, and kind of waited around and actually uh, took me to uh, someone who would volunteer to uh, harbor students, foreign students coming in and it was a local psych psychiatrist that I stayed with her and her son. So that was that was quite interesting for a month and month maybe two months until I got my uh, my feet on the ground was able to find a place, but uh, I I really uh, I really lucked out because uh, kind of by 
mistake or maybe it was meant to be. I met this fellow, he was one of the, uh, the mayors or one of the best of Paris in, in antique finishes, including bull, uh, bull marquetry. And uh, he offered up his uh, a studio apartment, which was part and parcel right behind his studio. So um, it was kind of like uh, kind of these real, real romantic ideas that if, if you're really into this, to be able to, to work in and live right behind the studio that's been there since the 18th century. And uh, so essentially I'd have to walk through the front of the studio any time of day to get to this small apartment that I was renting from this individual. And it was literally small. We're talking about eight feet by about 16 feet. And uh, the bathroom was literally four feet square. You turn the shower on, the water's on the toilet, the water's on the sink, and, and the, the toilets are quite, uh, quite uh, backwoodsy. Um, the heating system for the hot water, it's, it's a small heater on the wall. It takes quite a bit of time to get up. And then you, the, the, as soon as you drain the water, it takes recovery time. So the whole thing was difficult, particularly in the winter. And I had a little bunk. I had to go up seven, about seven feet. I had to make my own ladder to get up on this little landing above the, uh, the range and the refrigerator. So I was cramped. I went three feet above the, the bed level and the ceiling. So you can't turn over too much. You can't sit up, you hit your head. So it's crazy. But they were the accommodations. But nevertheless, they created for a, a great time. It was, I mean, almost like camping out and going to uh, maybe, uh, uh, you know, a place where you learn how to, to cut bears out of t uh, with chainsaws or something. I'm just liking it to that. It was almost like roughing it, uh, almost with a, a 19th, early 19th century flair. But in the back, there were a few windows in a really tiny courtyard, about 10 by 10. It was herringbone lined. And, and uh, you still saw four buildings behind, three stories high. And, and in the warmer months, you could hear somebody playing a piano at six o'clock at night. Somebody was playing a violin at 10. And you heard the same cast of characters. It was almost like uh, the, the great uh, movie Rear Window, I believe, in the 1950s. But uh, to be able to be in the 11th arrondissement and to come out and either side on the sidewalk, there were some great turners. So this was the artisan's enclave of the 11th arrondissement. And five doors down was the oldest, longest continuing tool seller boutique in the world, Gaynor Millon. Um, so everything was at your fingertips. The Eco Bull was uh, the equivalent of six, eight blocks away. And uh, so that, that, was, that was life and it was, uh, it was good. So it was like uh, camp, tra camp training or something. I don't know. Well, that sounds boot pretty camp. amazing. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. quite the uh, experience to reflect on later, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah. And you did briefly touch on, um, you know, obviously this gentleman provided you or offered you this studio apartment. Um, out of your experiences in France, how were you received by the French people? Um, I would, you know, I, I would say I probably met anywhere from 800 to 1,000 French people. I've had dinner with them. I've been in conferences with them. I've been in classes with them anywhere from young people and seventh graders up until, you know, centurions. Uh, and except for maybe one or two, um, everybody loved the American. Um, they received me well. They were always, um, and as I recall, being Benjamin Franklin in Paris, Everybody asked him to dinner. Everybody wanted to know what's your favorite drink, what's your favorite meal, mutton, what's your favorite type of wine, red Bordeaux. Um, everybody wants to know in advance, what do you like? And everybody was offering dinners and, and, and bringing their friends over to, to talk about uh, everything furniture and decorative arts related. So it was a, a, blooming, a blooming cultural uh, awareness in, in Paris in that area uh, with regards to furniture. So well, that sounds uh, wonderful. Yeah. And um, back to the Echo Bull, could you walk us through what you would consider a normal day of your coursework or studies? Yeah, it was interesting because uh, they, like, they, they like to get started early and the, uh, we have to remember that French furniture is going back probably 350 years now or more. So the French, the powers that be knew that after around 100 years, the furniture started to fall apart. You know, marquetry started to, uh, the adhesive failures, marquetry pieces were falling out, et cetera, et cetera. So they knew they had to develop a premier conservation restoration school. And that's why this started 100 years basically after French furniture started being made. Um, so uh, a typical day there started at 7 o'clock. And what always struck me in, in my class I had, quote, older students, anywhere from, say, 44 to, to, to 60. 
and there was only 15 of us. So just imagine that, the premier conservation program in the world, as far as I'm concerned and, and for what I could see. Um, and this is a hands-on program. This is, this is showing you how to disassemble chairs and Louis XIII commodes. This is not just trying to patch the piece of veneer like we see in these little American ditzy schools and weekend courses and things like that. Um, this is total disassembly and total, total reassembly. So this is like an, an engineering feat all wrapped up into a restoration course. Um, but what really struck me with these class size this small and only this few individuals interested in, in learning or, and most of this was retraining. These were older students going back or people that have lost their jobs and things of this nature. And me being the first American to come back and go through this program, um, I guess just remember days when it was in December and November and it was getting dark uh, or it wasn't going to get light too early. And I was walking at six o'clock, 6.15, you know, along the, the, uh, the bakeries of Paris, you know, the, uh, and smelling the, the, the croissants being baked and things like that. And, and Paris had not quite woken up yet. And, you know, the darkened streets of cobblestones and past buildings that had been shot up by the, you know, when the Germans occupied World War II and then coming up to the Eco Bull. And, uh, you know, as my comrades were there, the interesting thing, the benches were laid out in one long row of, say, 16 benches. And it was customary that everybody would stand by the, the front of their bench when you walk in a workbench like this one, a much better workbench than this one. And everybody would, uh, everybody would shake hands and kiss, the guys, the girls in the program. Um, so that was traditional. And, and you would do that in the morning, you do that when you went to lunch, when you came back from lunch, and when you left. So it was this this tactical experience that, you know, we are kind of in a brotherhood in this together of saving historical materialism. And even if we may have some differences, culturally speaking, or between countries or what, whatever, how you, however you turn them, um, it was all thrown aside and we were here for one good purpose, and that was to uh, to save historical property. Right? Oh, that's really interesting. Um, and the other interesting thing that would occur during lunch, which you wouldn't find here in American school, uh, we generally would, everyone would, would stay in the room at their benches and we'd form kind of groups, you know, maybe three groups of all of us and somebody would be uh, charged with picking the wine up for tomorrow or picking the, the baguettes or the, the cheese. And so we'd uh, all go through maybe a half a bottle of wine every lunch in this, and that's, that's the accepted way of life. And you could have young people there, people in seventh and eighth grade that were actually taking just a snippet of that restoration program, and yet they're having some of the wine too, so it's not frowned upon. So, and you must remember that, you know, when the French really endeavored into the shellac finish, um, they actually were using various types of wine, red wine, white wine, rosé wine, mixing it in with shellac flakes to, as a solvent for shellac. So this has kind of a crazy throwback with uh, the history of shellac. Um, but uh, yeah, so we, we start at seven o'clock and uh, we ended at five in the afternoon and they were long days and, and a lot of frustrating days because the, uh, the chef or the, as they call it, the head of the, the head professor, um, they're, they're tough, they're tough. They want perfection. I mean, you're, you're digging out a, a flute on a, on a fluted column on the side of a chest, a quarter colonnette fluted every you know he's looking with a magnifying glass to make sure you didn't that 220 or 320 grit abrasive you're running down you you missed this little spot and he's going with a magnifying glass so they're quite articulous meticulous so they have they all he had a tick case of meticulosis there's no problem no, no doubt about that but it all makes for a better student there's no doubt and i, I understand that fully so uh yeah so that's pretty much the day and um we would run three days a week in with my cohorts in the restoration classroom. And then we would actually go outside. The other two days a week, we would say it's two hours in, a, in an upholstery class, two hours in a blacksmith's class, two hours in sculpting, two hours in a marquetry class. So the, the next week, those two free days, we could go to the Louvre Museum or we could go to the Chateau de Versailles to actually work in their conservation labs. So really mixed it up well. Um, there's a little bit of travel doing that, you know, it could take uh, 45 minutes to get out to Versailles, but, uh, but it all worked out. But it's just a great over, overall well-rounded program. Uh, the only difficult, difficulty I had was uh, probably dealing with uh, some physics and chemistry and French. And they were good enough that they actually gave me, they gave me a full-time interpreter. And uh, the interpreter was to be with me from 7 in the morning 
till 9, 10 o'clock at night. If I had to do anything else outside that I felt that I couldn't do, which I generally could do everything I needed to do outside with the language, but that person was available to me um, for general living after hours. So that worked out very well. And it would have to be said, it was quite the honor that the French would do that. They were trying to make this into an international program, but unfortunately, a couple of years after I came back in 05, this program ceased. Uh, oh, lack, lack is, of students. That is unfortunate. Yeah. My goodness, it sounds wonderful. And um, I know you also completed some short courses at West Dean College. Can you describe in more detail about uh, maybe one or two of those courses and, and what they involved? I, I did a, I did a two month stint over at West Dean with uh, conservation of leather, and uh, you know because uh, I get into a lot of uh, you know sometimes handles and saddlery and things like this that need conservation. So that was a great eye opener, and I've taken uh, a few of the horological courses. I I, I never took the entire horological program for a master's degree over there. Uh, I took some short courses there, fortunately. So um, just enough to do what I need to do here. And, uh, but just a, just a masterful program. And um, there was always, again, at West Dean, the great thing, you could go into other studios and sign up for free because you're a student in what, what you're a student in and say I wanted to go in and learn violin making. I could hang out there for 16 hours, on a, eight on a Saturday, eight on a Sunday. So that was another added bonus. I generally didn't do that. I, I chose to go out into the field into another program there in architecture. So that's a wonderful option. And also we um, chatted off camera a little more and I understand that weekends were free at West Dean and that there were options to take a program in grade two certification in historic architecture preservation. Could you uh, describe what exactly does a grade two certification qualify a person to do and, and how long did that take for you to achieve? Well, this is one of these weekend, weekend programs I just alluded to and um, they would pick us up. Uh, there was only two of us partaking in this. Pick us up, I think it was like 6.30 in the morning. Um, we would go to historic manor houses or castles, um, probably within a 90 to 100 mile radius uh, around West Dean College. Um, to make it viable, otherwise it's too much travel for the day and then you come back and you do it again the next day. But um, for a grade two certification, you have to know all the, the trades. You have to know um, stone masonry, plastering, uh, timber framing, roofing, um, all on historic structures. And grade two and grade two star are the most endangered or most endangered slash important structures, whether manor houses or castles, that exist in England. And there's a plethora of them all around. Uh, a grade two listing, a grade two star, could be Westminster Abbey um, and uh, a number of other manor houses around. But we would sit there and we would actually be with other artisans that are grade star approved working and we would be working side by side, getting train training points, pointers and tips. And at the end of the program in a year, getting uh, passing the examination for certification. And also I put in there for damp. Uh, they're, they're huge on damp because damp leads all the degradation of all the, the natural materials that go into a, a dwelling. So that uh, coming back here with that, I, I, at that point coming back for several years, I never thought I'd use it. It was just a way to kill time on a weekend and, and uh, you know, just really to see a different point of architecture. Plus going in these manor houses and castles, you saw great clocks and the, the, the classic Chippendale, or Chippendale Queen Anne furniture of England. So, and, and you, you had uh, people that were your curators that I met at these places that, you know, would give us uh, stories and, and tell us facts about the objects and items and how they came to be and, and why they're still here and who owned them and all this. So it was uh, it was magical on the weekend. It was actually more fun on the weekends as, than it was taking the courses in the week. That's what it turned out to be. Because I'm actually putting this um, historic preservation to use now, which I wasn't quite sure that I would do because I was more based in the conservation preservation of furniture and clocks. And West Dean has multifaceted conservation advanced degrees. I know you uh, discussed that with me, including one in clock conservation. Can you expound on that degree and what it encompasses? You know, it's a it's a very interesting program. I mean, there's you probably can't comment on any one specific program on clocks at West Dean because they can tailor to your needs. Uh, again, you can get a bachelor's, you can get a uh, single certificate program, a master's program, and I believe they have a PhD program now. And, and all of this starts out, generally, if you're getting the bachelor's or anything else, you're actually producing or building a clock. So you're, you're flattening the plates, you're, 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 laying, you're laying out your gear trains and things like that. 
um, you're cutting gears. So you're literally creating movement. That's the first thing. And then that segues into actually the conservation and restoration, which uh, horological conservation is really on the, you know, it's in its infancy, um, you know, how to handle these metal surfaces. Wood conservation has been around for many years. And for too long, too, too many people have not cared about clocks. Um, and I, I see that probably, you know, really in moving its way into a lot of the, the major museums in this country because even Winter Tour doesn't have any uh, anything to do with a clock conservation program. I've been in and I've seen their clocks and there's some people in Winter Tour that actually hang two or three weights on a particular clock to overpower it because it's it's worn out. I mean, how, how bad is that? So uh, that's absolutely shocking to say the least. But um, so they don't have standards there. And I, I think they may have a couple of volunteers that wind the clocks, look at the clocks, take care. But maybe in the future, places like Winter Tour or the PMA are going to come in and put a, an existing program of conservation on their existing time pieces. Well, thank you so much. And that's all the time we have for this session. But we'd like to join you again to continue this discussion um, and even more specifically on your time at the Echo Bowl. Okay, we'll see you soon. Great. Thank you.